I say something funny? Okay, so the next presentation, uh, some new tools to detect stressors at a metabolic level in aquatic insects is going to be presented by Scott Johnson. And um, Jesus uh, Reyes, he, he's not here. Oh, okay. He will be. Very good. And they're from the, you know, California, I mean, they're from um, Aquatic Bioassay Laboratories in Ventura, a sponsor for your donut holes that I was uh, slamming a little bit early, but we do love donut holes. But uh, they've been, Scott's been a part of this for a long time uh, and doing bioassessment. He's going to be giving the presentation. Scott? Am I on? Hello? Got it? Okay. Everybody ready for lunch? Yeah. No. So uh, thanks for uh, that, Jim. I um, really appreciate being a part of this. Um, this is our, I think I've been here for 10 years, and, and it's just continued to improve in, in quality and, and uh, the information that we get from it. Um, what I'd like to do today is present some information regarding a special study sponsored by the San Gabriel River Regional Monitoring Program um, that focused on a new tool to detect stress in aquatic insects at the metabolic level. And I think based on a lot of the talks that we've seen over the last 24 hours, um, there's a lot of question about how to make the links between biological condition and, and key stressors in, in these watersheds that we're studying. And so what I'd like to do before I get started and too wrapped around this is do the acknowledgments so I don't forget. Um, this idea was brought to us by Rich Gossett and Kevin Kelly at the Hermes Laboratory at Cal State Long Beach. And Jesus Reyes, who will be following me up here to go through the details of the methodology and some of the results at the Pacific Coast Environmental Conservancy. Wendy Willis from our lab um, participated and did all the taxonomy, uh, field collections of the fresh invertebrate samples that we needed to make this method work and also dialed in the preservation techniques that were necessary to um, not denature the proteins that you'll be hearing about in just a few minutes. And finally, Christy Morris from the Council for Watershed Health, who kind of had an insight when we presented this to her that this was important and that we needed to move forward with, with the idea. And finally, the San Gabriel River uh, Monitoring Program stakeholder group who came together in 2004 to design and implement uh, probably the first of its kind in California, at least, ambient monitoring program based on probabilistic design with fully randomized site selection. So the outline for our talk is basically, I'll give you a little bit of background on the San Gabriel River program, um, talk about our stressor identification using the multiple lines of evidence approach, and then Jesus is going to come up and talk about uh, proteomics, the technique that we're trying to dial in on aquatic insects give a little bit of background on that so you understand exactly what the technique does, uh, the study design and methodology we used, and finally so a few results and how we intend on moving forward with this project. So a little bit about the San Gabriel River watershed. In the upper right corner is a map of the watershed. It begins at the uh, Pacific Ocean at sea level and goes up to about elevations of over 10,000 feet. The upper watershed is almost all open space, uh, completely rural and in relatively good, uh, from a stream uh, condition standpoint, good condition. The watershed's not unique in Southern California. It's hydrologically disconnected completely. The upper watershed to the lower watershed through a series of dams, uh, reservoirs, and spreading basins. And then the lower watershed is a mixture of um, highly modified stream channels that some have natural stream bottoms and others are, are cement lined. And those flow into a concrete lined POTW effluent dominated channel that runs 20 miles from the foothills essentially um, to the Pacific Ocean where it empties into the San Gabriel River estuary, which is a highly modified tidal prism at this point and has lost most of its ecological function. So in 2004, when the group came together, they decided to use a multiple lines of evidence approach uh, following a prob probability-based ran randomized design with benthic macroinvertebrates being kind of the trump card or our indicator of biological condition, which you've heard a lot about. Um, and then a full suite 
of water quality indicators um, and physical habitat assessments to try to tease out what the key stressors are on the biological condition in this watershed, including water chemistry, dissolved metals, nutrients, and organics, um, toxicity using the Serodaphnia seven-day survival and reproduction test, and physical habitat was measured using the swamp protocols and uh, CRAM. To date, uh, most of the data that I'm presenting today is about six years worth of data, but we've been uh, conducting monitoring during dry weather um, since 2005, uh, nearly eight years. So just some brief results so you get an idea of where we were going with this. Um, this is just a, a, a map showing the spatial biological condition in the watershed over about a six-year period. And as you would expect, the upper watershed had the best biological condition and the lower watershed had the worst biological condition. One thing I failed to mention is that there's approximately two million people living in the lower watershed. It's highly urbanized. Um, yeah, a key point, probably. Um, and there's really nothing that's unmodified or unurbanized in the lower watershed. So it's a really distinct line between the upper and lower watersheds. Um, one thing of interest is there were some sites in the upper watershed that actually scored below the Southern California IBI impairment threshold. Not a lot, but, but several. And that continues to happen every year. And so those sites are of interest because, in general, most of them have really good physical habitat condition. And in the lower watershed, where you see all the pretty hammered conditions as far as the biological condition, um, we have sites that scored somewhat better and actually almost went over the impairment threshold. So to us, those are the sites that are of most interest. Generally, ones that are in cement line channels probably aren't of as great interest. Um, these are uh, CRAM scores over the course of the six-year period, CRAM being a measure of physical habitat quality that takes into account the buffer zones and the stream bed morphology and biotic structure of, the, uh, of a site. And you can see it's pretty clear cut that in the upper watershed, you've got pretty good physical habitat conditions, and in the lower watershed, pretty bad physical habitat conditions. So right away, you have kind of a correlative um, idea of what's going on here, or associative idea. We went through and uh, using all the water quality parameters, anywhere there were regulatory thresholds, we went through and plotted the data to see if they exceeded the thresholds. Or, and in most cases, essentially all cases, this, in this case is dissolved uh, copper, uh, the CTR California toxics rule, which is a hardness adjusted measure, and the thresholds for chronic and acute CTR are based on laboratory testing. But for the most part, all, all of the metals that we measured over the six year period fell below all the regulatory thresholds, nutrients were below the thresholds, and essentially all of the uh, organics were non-detects. We did get some hits for pyrethroids here and there, but nothing that was really significant. So that was another way of looking at the data to try and make some linkages between condition, biological condition, and um, uh, biological condition and the um, key stressors in the watershed. Finally, we did some multivariate analysis. This is just a box plot of principal components analysis. There's two main components, over, which includes all the data, all the parameters together, including the IBI scores. And each of these components together describe about 60% of the variability in the data set. And you can see there's a strong, the UW is upper watershed, MS is main stem channel, and LW is lower watershed. And you can see that there's a strong gradient along the physical habitat condition and then also along the sediment, uh, uh, sediment gradient. And for upper watershed and main stem, they're pulled pretty strongly apart by physical habitat, but in the lower watershed, we have a lot of um, kind of variability or spread in the lower watershed sites, and some of that has to do with where they're located, like the two red dots on the right-hand side were located in the uh, lower foothills, and therefore maybe it was more how we designated the sites um, as far as how they fell out in this, in this analysis. But in any case, um, these lower watershed sites are of interest because some of them, they're, they're scoring differently in this type of a, of a components analysis. So I, I shamelessly took this from one of the SCORP technical documents looking at um, using causal assessment in both the Santa Clara River watershed and down in San Diego because I wanted to just make the point that the causal assessments are great and I know that there's a lot of work going on with them right now. Um, but what we have to do is go through one constituent at a time 
and try to begin to build stories, associative type stories, as to what is affecting the biological condition in a watershed. And on the right-hand side, you can see a San Diego site with impaired biological condition was, uh, had high conductivity compared to reference sites. And so we begin to think, well, maybe conductivity is playing a role in what's going on with the biological condition. But how certain are we of that as we move through? Um, in some cases, we'll be really certain, and there won't be any doubt as to what we need to do. But because there's a remediation process and a regulatory process going on with this, um, we we think that there might be ways to improve our understanding and linkages between the biological community and these key stressors. And what if the bugs could talk to us? What if they knew what was stressing them and were able to you know, give us an idea of, of what direction to go in to help remediate these sites? So with that, um, Rich Gossett and, and Kevin Kelly came to us about two and a half years ago and they were interested in, in looking at the phenotopic, phenotypic response measurements that they were working on in their laboratory, namely proteomics as biomarkers and a, and a methodology in understanding environmental water quality effects. And there's kind of two schools of thought with this. One is endocrine responses, which most of you have heard a lot about, measuring one or a multiple set of endocrine responses in these animals to determine what's stressing them. And then tissue expression responses. And today, we're going to be discussing, Jesus is going to bring to you what we've done on this uh, technique called proteomics. All right. So I'm going to explain to you guys, I guess, in a nutshell, sort of what proteomics is. If some of you guys don't know, you guys haven't heard of this technique. Essentially, it's a technique that's used to be able to produce what are called protein profiles. Uh, we're able to produce these protein profiles on organisms from specific sites. By doing so, we're able to not only identify some of those proteins, but we're also able to map the proteins of these organisms in their environments. And we're able to basically do this for the entire cellular protein group that is found in those organisms. As Florida was pointed out, this is really a strong tool to use, and it's very powerful because it allows us to understand the phenotypic responses that are occurring in these animals due to the environments that they're living in. We're able to look at things like reproduction, growth and development, any sort of toxicological effects, even metabolic effects. That, in a nutshell, is going to an organism and asking it, what is this environment doing to you? And what better way to assess an environment than going to the animals that actually live there and looking at what's happening to them? We also can use this to look at these environmental factors. Okay? Each protein becomes what's called a distinct biomarker. And we're able to look at these distinct biomarkers and look at how they are reflective of a, of a distinctive environmental factor, such as maybe some sort of contaminant, some sort of pollute. So for example, if you go to an environment and you know that there's some specific PCB there, we can then go to that organism and maybe we can see a specific protein that pops up that's there to basically take care of that PCB, either to remove it from the body or biotransform it within the organism so they can get rid of it. So now we're able to map this protein and identify to a specific contaminant. That becomes even more powerful because as we develop the technique and as we develop more biomarkers, in essence, we identify more proteins, we're able to increase our diagnostic power of the environment and in the organisms. And down the line, this has huge prospects to being able to uh, be used as a full-time tool to go to certain environments. And even before you actually do any sort of sediment toxicity or water toxicity test, you can go and do a very simple protein screen. And if that same protein pops up that popped up before for that specific PCB, you know that that site is being affected by that, by that specific PCB without ever doing any sort of sediment or water quality test. So I've thrown the word proteomics around. Scott's thrown the word proto proteomics around. Why are proteins so important? Well, maybe for some of you guys, in the last couple of years, genomics and the word genes was really sort of the big buzzword. Um, in essence, proteins are really what regulate the physiological functions of all these organisms. Yeah, genes are important. I'm not going to stand up here and say genes aren't important, because they are. But it's the proteins that are really doing all the work. When you look at an organism and you look at things like cellular transportation, it's the proteins that are transporting those things through that cell, not the genes. 
when you look at secondary messengers that are in charge of activating certain physiological mechanisms, it's the proteins that are activating those things, not the genes. And when you look at things like enzymatic reactions that produce new products, again, it's the proteins doing that work and not the genes. So looking at proteins are real important. It's like having a store. The genes are in the front because everyone likes to look at them, but the proteins are the guys in the back doing all the work. And it's important work that keeps this organism functioning physiologically in the correct mode that it's supposed to be in. So one of the other cool things about this technique is that if you know that an organism is being exposed by a certain contaminant, let's say, whatever protein is in charge of sort of dealing with that contaminant, the more that contaminant is present in the environment and the more that organism has to deal with it, the more protein is going to be expressed in that organism. So the amount of protein expressed definitely is linked to the amount or the duration of the stress the organism is facing. Um, each individual protein map or protein profile is very specific to each of the species that we work with, and they're very reproducible. We can do this for maybe one specific uh, organism, or we can do them for a very, uh, various amount of organisms. And what's great about this tool is that we can look at multiple proteins at one time. And what this does is we use a very powerful program that aligns the gels or the proteins that we've created, and I'll show you guys an example of this, and basically looks at proteins that are always there. As organisms, we all have muscles, so troponin and tropomyosin are always in there. You take those proteins that are always there, you align them, and all the other proteins that have changed expression due to environmental impacts will pop up. And the program will tell you which ones have, been, uh, have increased in uh, um, exposure or which ones have decreased. I'm not going to kill you guys with the lab methodology because I'm sure you guys will get bored with it. But real quickly, what we do is we take the samples and we have to homogenize the samples so that we can run them on an IEF. Once we prep the samples, the samples for protein are run on a strip, which essentially separates the proteins out by its PI, which is essentially its pH. Then that strip is put on a 2D gel, and the proteins are then separated out by its mass. Once the mass of the proteins has been separated, we take the gel and we stain it. Once it's de-stained, we're able to see the proteins due to the staining process. We're able to identify which proteins we want to look at. We pick them out. We spot them on the plate. We stick them into the multi-top system, which basically shoots a high-powered uh, laser, vaporizes the protein, sends it through a mass spec, separates everything out and identifies our protein by running those, pro that, I'm sorry, that result through a local and external database which is updated constantly. So it's a very powerful database, very powerful tool. This is essentially what we produce. We're able to produce a protein profile of the organism from that environment. As I mentioned earlier, the first step is separating out the proteins by its PI. Once we run it on 2D gel, you separate the proteins out by its molecular weight we're able to essentially produce a very unique profile for every individual organism at every different or every specific environment, almost like a fingerprint. And Dr. Kelly, Kevin Kelly from Kelsey Long Beach, who's my collaborator, he has a great analogy with this. He says, this is basically like a constellation. And I mentioned earlier that there's certain proteins that are always located there. When you guys look up in the night sky, North Star should always relatively be in the same spot. So with these things, there are certain proteins that are always there. We can then take those proteins and then align them. And the program that we use can tell you how much different one protein is from one gel to the next. And I guess there's a laser in here somewhere. Yes. So you would imagine that a protein change of this magnitude is very, very visible. But it can also detect even slight fold changes in the protein. So the program can actually give you the full difference of the proteins from one environment to the next. The other cool thing about this program is that when, as a human, when we look at this gel, we just kind of focus on these really dark spots. But because the staining process directly stains the proteins that are found in this gel, the program can actually identify even the faintest of protein quantities in these gels. And so any single gel, you'll likely get thousands of proteins that are actually found in each individual gel. And it's our job to kind of look at the ones that actually change from one environment to the next. So I'm, uh, I guess I'm kind of the odd man out in this group because I'm a fish guy. Uh, so please don't uh, boo me if I say anything that you guys don't like. But one of the things my organization works with is usually fish models. Okay, So I usually work with fish. And one of the products that we 
uh, our one of the projects that we're part of is the Colorado Lagoon project. And I know some of you guys are from uh, Southern California, so you know about this. For you of you, for those of you that don't, the Colorado Lagoon is an environment that over a long time was basically cut off from its connection to uh, the main waterway. Now it's not totally cut off because there's actually an underground connection that runs underneath this large park, which extends about a thousand feet. But because of this, the natural fluctuation of the tides does not, does not flush the system out properly. And over about 60 plus years, the city of Long Beach said, hey, we got a good idea. Let's stick 12 storm drains and just drain and dump them into that lagoon. Well, for them, that was a good idea, but unfortunately, that essentially made this a very toxic sink. Right? About two years ago, people that live around this area, which you can see is highly urbanized and is probably about half of the two million people that Scott mentioned, um, the city, people from that area got together and told the city, you need to clean that up. And the city finally said, all right, we'll clean it up. So they're going through a restoration process right now. We went in there and decided that we could do some work. And so what we did is we essentially focus on two native fish species, staghorn sculpin and shiner perch. And what we're doing is we're identifying the protein profiles of these organisms during the restoration process, and then we're gonna go back in after restoration to see if we can identify whether or not the organisms have actually sort of become healthier due to the restoration process. We've been also lucky enough to have to come up here because uh, it's a great place up here in Northern California. And we've done some other studies and luckily we have some samples from Redwood City for both species that we can use as comparison. And what you see is that those fish, uh, in this case, Pacific Staghorn Sculpin from Colorado Lagoon, show some differences in some of the protein profiles when compared to this Redwood City site, which up here is kind of our reference site. As all of us know, there is no clean site anywhere in the world probably. So we have to use reference with quotation marks. But for the studies that we do, Redwood City works like a pretty good reference site. And you can see that in some cases, some proteins are completely gone at the reference location, yet pop up in this impacted site. Now these proteins could be in charge of maybe removing some sort of pesticide, some sort of contaminant. Colorado Lagoon is known to have high levels of chloridanes and PCBs. So maybe these two proteins here play a role in that. When we look at shiner perch, same thing, right? We see some proteins completely gone. And in some cases, as I mentioned earlier, this program is strong enough to even detect fold increases even though the proteins are still there. So whatever is in that environment, whatever contaminants, whatever stressors that environment has on these organisms, we can pick out which proteins have been changed due to that exposure and we can identify them and then sort of correlate that to what the environment is doing. So, as Scott mentioned, Dr. Kevin Kelly, Rich Gossett, and Scott, and everyone from the watershed group got together and said, well, the first question was, can there be difference, uh, differences in protein expression detected in the same species collected from a reference and a non-reference stream reach? That was the first question. And after talk, we all got all excited because of what we were doing, and then actually we realized, wait a minute, I work with fish, no one's ever done aquatic uh, macroinvertebrates. So then the real question became, can it even be done? Really, we kind of pulled our collar and we're like, you know? Because no, none of us were sure what was gonna happen. So that's really what this project became. It became a project to develop the methods to see whether or not proteomics could be used in aquatic macroinvertebrates to do this type of analysis. So we were able to get samples from uh, Scott and his group for these two species, Hydropsyche and Beta Sedonis. Uh, which are commonly found in both the upper and lower San Gabriel River watershed. Now the initial attempt at this did not work. We were using archive samples and I tried and tried and tried and I do not know at this point in time if it was the samples themselves being archived for a certain period of time or maybe the ethanol that it was stored in but we just were not getting any results. But luckily Scott and his group, specifically Wendy, went out and got me some fresh, sa fresh samples. She collected two sets of samples, one in 95% ethanol, ethanol, I'm sorry, and one just in water. Both of them held in ice. And even though both yielded results, the ones that yielded the best results or the optimal results were the ones that were held uh, in water on ice. So we were able to determine that that was the best methodology to go forward with our study. 
I don't want to go into the details of the methodology, but if you want me to talk to you about that on the side, I'd be more than happy to. It's very intense, very labor intensive, very meticulous, but it's awesome because the results you get something like this, okay? The fact that this gel was produced and we have protein hits for these species, I basically jumped out of my shoes because again, I'm a fish guy. I've never worked with more than anything other than fish. So the fact that I was able to do it on insects was, or macroinvertebrates, was great. We got results for both species. So I went to Dr. Kevin Kelly, was super excited and said, we did it, we got it, it can work. What do you think we should do next? And he said, well, since you got the gels, why don't you plug some of those proteins out and see if you can identify them? So that's what I did next. Um, just to give you guys sort of a run through of how we identify these proteins. Uh, there's three main things that are really important when you get a report after you run the proteins. One is you want to identify the protein. So the protein name is pretty important. Um, but then the other two are the protein score and the protein uh, confidence interval. Obviously, you want to have a really high confidence interval. That tells you that the database has said, you know what, I can tell you for certain that that's the protein that you got. The higher the protein score, the better. Usually scores higher than 100 are the best, but you can still work with protein scores that are a little lower than that, maybe like in the 70, 65 range, as long as your confidence interval is also pretty high. These were the highest protein scores that I got, 100, 200, 3, 400. Those are really good scores. And we were able to identify these proteins here, which I'm also going to cover in the next slide. But I was also able to identify some proteins that didn't have such high protein scores. They actually scored around 75, 80, but they had really high confidence intervals. And some of those proteins were actually pretty unique and pretty interesting. Um, in terms of metabolism, we were able to identify two proteins, arginine kinase and DNA-directed RNA polymerase. In terms of physiological cell signaling, we identified ATPA synthase and apoptosis regulator, which is actually kind of interesting. Structurally, these are pretty common. I mentioned troponin and tropomyosin, usually found in muscle, so that's not too big of a deal. But this is where everyone sort of uh, focuses their attention on. We were able to identify some pretty key proteins that are in charge of stress response and detoxification. Things like heat shock protein 70, metallothionine protein type 2, conotoxin, hepcidin, and glutathione S transferase. Those are some pretty specific proteins that are only found in these organisms because of some specific contaminant found in the environment. So I'm not going to lie, and I don't want to boast too much, but I took out 12 proteins and I got 11 hits, and they were all pretty good. And that was just a small subset of the proteins that we could do uh, with this type of project. So we go back to question number one. Can proteomics be used to map protein expression in aquatic insects? Yes. And really, there probably should be 20 exclamation points after that because <laughs> we were able to do this. Um, it's a really powerful tool that we can use. What we were also able to do was determine the best preservation and storage techniques to optimize the results that we were able to yield in this project. Also, we provided the beginning of a species-specific biomarker database for each of these aquatic insects. The fact that Dr. Kelly said, you know what, you maybe want to run a couple of proteins, basically starts the database library for this type of project. Having said that, though, there definitely has to be more work to be done to create a more comprehensive protein profile to uh, increase the amount of proteins used as biomarkers for these types of studies. But what we learned was that the holding times for some of these organisms are really important, and the fact that we were able to determine that holding them, holding them on ice really yields an optimal result for, the, for this project. Um, this part isn't really, doesn't really deal too much with me, but it is important, it deals with Scott and the rest of his group, is finding resident species that are both found in a reference location and a location that's not a non-reference location. Maybe sounds easier than it should be, but I'm not out in the field. That's why I sort of yield to Scott and, and everyone else. You know, that might be something to, to think about, but I'm sure that you can find organisms that are found in both areas, uh, depending on which sites you're looking at to study. And this last point here, what are the effects of collection and preservation on gene expression? That's also something that's pretty important, something that we keep uh, in mind as we do some of these studies and as we do some of these analysis in our lab. And for future studies, really we get back to the original question. Before we all pull our collars and we're like, Yeesh, can this even be done? The original question is, now can we find differences in protein expressions 
And can they be detected in the same species collected at reference and non-reference stream reaches? Now this is doable. We know that the procedure works. We know that the techniques work. We know that we've optimized the techniques. We know we got protein results, and some of those proteins were actually pretty interesting. And each subsequent sample that we run now builds a protein database for several species. And so to summarize, we basically were able to produce this methodology, which yielded results. And it's a very powerful tool, because instead of using just one specific biomarker, we're able to use potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of proteins to identify sort of the environmental impacts that those animals are facing on a daily basis, which I think is pretty important and pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So with that said, I'd like to thank you guys for your time and your attention. Hopefully, you guys aren't too hungry. I'm sure Scott will answer most of these questions. Um, hi. Uh, hi. How long were your hold times? And I was wondering, um, how quickly does the protein expression happen? Because I was wondering uh, what, like, if the protein hits are reflecting your new environment of BMIs inside of your jar versus um, being out in the field, you know, because you have them all in the jar, and even if it's cold, everybody's still alive and interacting with each other and stuff, and there are new stressors once you get them in there. Well, you, I'll do that part, but if you want to do the holding time, because I... Yeah, Wendy? <laughs> uh, I'm assuming that, that w what would you say the holding times would be on those? About 24 hours. Yeah, so pretty quick, and, and that's, that's a problem with, with the, the methodology, is that especially if you're in backcountry, dragging samples out and getting them to the lab. So that's something we have to work on and see if we can bring those whole time, uh, increase those whole times somehow. Yeah, oh, okay. to go ahead. To answer the, the second part of your question, there are gonna be some proteins that might change expression due to just to the fact of maybe collection, which is why I brought up that question. Good, does that have an impact on these expressions? And that's very, that, that's very easily doable in terms of looking at it in an experimental fashion. You can take organisms and either you know, freeze them straight onto dry ice or flash freeze them somehow, stopping that process. But even if we don't do that, some of the proteins that might be changed due to, let's say, being hanging around themselves in the, in the little vial or whatnot, you know, you'll probably see those proteins, but when you see something like methylothionine, and glu that has nothing to do with sort of that sort of impact. So, but there's definitely ways around that. Yeah, we can do techniques to sort of prevent any sort of like side effects due to the capturing and, and, and containment of the animals. Yeah. Um, I got a question, that's okay. Um, uh, that's very cool stuff. I, and uh, I suppose you might know that um, there are other researchers out there that are using that technique for what we call contaminants or emerging concern. Um, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, definitely. for like pharmaceuticals. Oh, no, yes, definitely. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's come a long way. Uh, but one, one, one I think, um, I guess it might be a criticism or, or just a constraint to worry about, is, is what's the actual um, variability that you see, let's say seasonally, or you know, uh, sampling different times, uh, and also between organisms of the same species? So in terms of sampling at different times, uh, I mentioned that I mostly work with fish. Uh, one of the main projects we started off doing this uh, technique was working on English sole from an alfal site versus a non-alfal site. And we would sample um, just like they do their sampling every, uh, a quarterly. And we saw very minimal variability between, let's say, reproductive season and non-reproductive season. Very minimal. Um, so I don't think, I mean, again, my area of expertise is not macroinvertebrates in the aquatic environment. This is something new to me. Um, but in terms of the stuff that we've done in the past, we don't see too much in terms of variability, in, in, at least in the fish species that we work with. So. My question was related to um, you know, what these things really pick up, and that is, I know it seems like a really good technique as far as you know, picking up uh, you know, elevated contaminants of emergent concern or pH, you know, maybe metals and pyrethroids and things like that. Um, but I think a lot of us know that one of the main stressors of benthic macroinvertebrates are physical habitat things, you know, fines and sands and other habitat-related features. I mean, 
what do you think, is this going to be able to answer some of those questions as well, or is it just going to be more towards water quality things? No, I, I think it, it can be used to answer those questions as well. I mean, if an organism is stressed, let's say, because of, of water flow, you know, that, that, that might have an impact on, you know, specific proteins. I, again, I don't know these, mod, these animals as well, but, you know, if an animal has to use its motor skills a little more or whatnot, you might see highly elevated levels of troponin or tropomyosin because they've got to be moving around. In terms of canopy cover, you know, the temperature rises, maybe some heat shock proteins go up in certain areas. I mean, those heat shock proteins, you know, may be sort of indicative of sort of the, the, the quality of the environment that has nothing to do with, let's say, toxicological effects. Um, this is where building this library, building these biomarkers can sort of help answer those questions. You know, I, I think that it would definitely be able to pick up on some of the stuff that's not contaminated related. Um, you know, you saw a lot of sort of novel, no, normal looking proteins like ATPA synthase and all that stuff. So some of those components would probably be teased out in terms of identifying the stuff that's not related to just pollution and contaminants. I have two questions. One is, can you also use those proteins when you have algae, for example, benthic diatoms? And, you, and, and can you use up. that when you have a community? Because we can't single out one individual diatom. If you have several different diatoms, can you use that as well? Correct. So again, I'm a fish guy. But um, <laughs> in terms of s separating out each individual diatom, uh, that also poses a problem because one of the technique or one of the things for this technique is that you have to have a certain amount of protein to be able to run the analysis. It's not a ton, but you do need a certain amount. And I'm assuming the diatom is probably a single diatom is not going to have enough protein to be able to analyze every single individual organism. Uh, so you are going to run into cases where you might have to do sort of batch groupings or do a certain amount. Um, so you know that 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 poses sort of a, I guess an, an issue. Uh, but going back to that question about variability, we actually did some batch runs with, with these samples, and we ran multiple gels on multiple batches, no difference. So it was you know, pretty. Now, granted, we didn't have an N of 50 gels. Uh, we had an N of about five gels. But if you increase the sample size, you, know, you, you could kind of remove some of, that, some of that stuff out. In terms of the algae stuff, yeah, I don't, I'm not even going to, because I have no clue. I'm not going to lie. I knew, I knew you were going to ask that question, though, Louie. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a fun job. Yeah. Nobody wants Pick to diatoms. eat. Pick diatoms. <laughs> I, I, one thing I, I'm sorry I failed to, to say was that uh, Wendy, when she finally got the animals and had them on ice, um, she would bring them back and had to sort the sample, right, out of, and so um, she had um, mayflies and everybody running all over a petri dish trying to catch them with their forceps. So <laughs> she was complaining to me about that one morning. Hi. Sorry. Um, so you're a fish guy, and fish don't molt. Have you done a time series to see how protein expression changes as uh, the insects, especially, say, um, the, the dipterans are going through their life cycle? Yeah, you mentioned molting, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, OK, I didn't catch that part. I was like, what? Uh, um, yeah, we, ha we haven't done that. So we haven't, that's something that we, and when I was looking at, into the literature, for this specific project, I came across that, and I thought that was probably going to be uh, pose an issue. But as we did the samples, as I mentioned, we had different batches. Um, within those batches, since I'm not the one that stood there under the microscope and separated them out into maybe different life stages, I don't know exactly where they, they sat. But again, when I did the batches, if there would have been some sort of impact due to the, you know, the chitinous exoskeleton or whatnot, it probably would have shown up in variability within the gels, and they didn't. I don't know if that means that there was no sort of difference in the stage, life stages of these animals, or maybe it was sort of, uh, sort of kind of covered in the background. But that's something that I definitely thought about when this project was starting. I did a lot of research on that. And when, as I mentioned in, in the talk, this really became about can the methods work for this? Now it's time to actually hone in on really fixing those little questions. But the fact that that stuff works and has the potential for you to identify a ton of proteins and correlate that to sort of the environmental uh, you know, time frame, I think that's a pretty powerful tool. But that's definitely stuff that we have to sort of look at as we go forward with different specific projects. <laughs>